Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service for another in a series of our public programs and, and guest lecturers. We're uh, honored to have you tonight. We have, a, as you look on the chair, we have a full schedule of events coming up over the next several days and weeks, so we invite you back to join us. Before I introduce uh, our student who will make the introduction, let me welcome a special guest, and, and that is my friend, the Director of the Department of Education, Dr. Ken James, from the State Department of Education. <laughs> Today's focus, or tonight's focus, is on education. Uh, and we have with us uh, the Arkansas Teacher of the Year, may, may soon be the National Teacher of the Year, certainly a finalist. To make the introduction is one of our students who has a unique relationship uh, with our speaker. They were high school classmates together at Fayetteville High School. They both then went on uh, to, to work in the Teach for America organization. Um, and they renewed that friendship when Elizabeth uh, did our radio interview of our speaker. So please welcome uh, from Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, via Teach for America and a lot of other places, Elizabeth Brill. creativity, 
and the compassion of every one of you in this room to help us achieve that goal. Our work as teachers is shaped by a host of policy issues. Healthcare, immigration, the decision to go to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I know that many of you are addressing these kinds of issues in your work. And whether or not you're focused on education policy specifically, you are shaping my life as a teacher because you're shaping the lives of the students that I teach. Schools have become the social safety net in many ways. We are often the ones who are responsible for making sure that kids get glasses, for making sure they get enough to eat on the weekends, and also making sure that every day when they come to school, they feel safe. When I taught in New York City, many of my students had asthma because they don't build incinerators in the richer areas of Manhattan. They tend to build them in the lower income neighborhoods where community resistance doesn't carry quite the same weight. I had a student named Johnny who had asthma, severe asthma, and it woke him up every night. So this kid who's nine years old would wake up and think that he was dying because he couldn't breathe. But every day he came to school excited to learn, and he never took out that frustration or that fear on me or any of the other students at the school. When I began teaching, I tended to see these issues only in how they impacted the students while they were in my classroom. So if Johnny had asthma, it really only mattered because he was falling asleep in class. If Tiani didn't have a clean, well-lighted place to study because she shared a two-bedroom apartment with 14 other people, it mattered because she didn't have her homework each day. Later, I realized that I really should have inverted those two worlds. And my students' time in my classroom only matters to the extent that it shapes their lives outside the classroom and improves their lives there as well. Johnny is one of the sweetest, most good-natured kids that you will ever meet in your life. He deserves better. He deserves better air quality, a better health care system, and better schools. All of you have a role to play in making children's lives better. And I would like to acknowledge just the people in this room right now. If you are a teacher in any sense of that word, could you please stand up so that we can recognize you? Let's have a round of applause. If you are a parent who are really children's first teachers, could you please stand up?
And then please introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you if you don't already know them, and tell them about those positive memories. Go.
When I hear about this type of standardization, it reminds me of a book that I read in my fourth graders called A Wrinkle in Time. And could you please raise your hand if you've read this book by Madeline Lengel? I just wanted to read a selection from this book. Below them, the town was laid out in harsh, angular patterns. The houses in the outskirts were all exactly alike, small square boxes painted gray. Each had a small rectangular plot of lawn in front, with a straight line of dull-looking flowers edging the path to the door. Meg had a feeling that if she could count the flowers, there would be exactly the same number for each house. In front of all the houses, children were playing. Some were skipping rope, some were bouncing balls. Meg felt vaguely that something was wrong with their play. It seemed exactly like children playing around any housing development at home, and yet there was something different about it. She looked at Calvin and saw that he, too, was puzzled. Look, Charles Wallace said suddenly, they're skipping and bouncing in rhythm. Everyone's doing it at exactly the same moment. This was so. As the skipping rope hit the pavement, so did the ball. As the rope curved over the head of the jumping child, the child with the ball caught the ball. Down came the ropes, down came the balls, over and over again. Up, down, all in rhythm, all identical, like the houses, like the paths, like the flowers. <coughs> Think about those positive experiences that you talked about earlier today as your most positive memories from elementary school. Think about the impact of a scripted curriculum on those kinds of experiences. You don't find that crime being perpetrated against children in upper income schools very often. It tends to be a misguided response on the part of administrators who are desperate to raise their test scores. Often, if a school is put in school improvement, it ends up stigmatizing the school community and also limiting the autonomy of the principal and the morale of the teachers. So it makes sense that these schools are nervous about that possibility. All teachers support standards, the idea that we can agree that there are certain concepts in reading, writing, math, science, and other subjects that children do need to learn. But standards are not the same thing as standardization. It's the difference between agreeing that there's a beautiful mountaintop that all children should get the chance to see, and mandating that all children walk the same path to get there in the same amount of time, wearing the same size shoes. I believe the antidote to the type of standardization embodied in a scripted curriculum lies in the fusion of two concepts that at first glance might seem like opposites, high expectations and differentiated instruction. <coughs> I tell my students every day, your choices determine your destiny. When I began teaching in West Harlem in the fall of 2000, I realized that if I believed in my students' power to shape their own destinies, they proved themselves capable of anything. If I expected each child to become a strong reader, an eloquent writer, a curious scientist, and a gifted mathematician, each child did. I also realized that despite the debates I had heard about nature versus nurture, there was something kindled in each of my students that went beyond genetics and went beyond the home environment. That unnamed quality that makes Daniela Daniela, Salvador Salvador, and Vanessa Vanessa. Call it soul, call it spirit, or leave it unnamed. But I believe that everything we do as teachers should honor that individuality. For the past seven years, I've had the chance to teach my students about the world. This year, beginning tonight, I had the chance to teach the world about my students. Daniela wants to be a teacher when she grows up. At age seven, she already has the qualities that it takes to become a good one. Intelligence, creativity, compassion, determination. The first day of school, she tried to steal my whiteboard markers and sneak them into her backpack so that she could practice teaching on her little brother Juanito, who is in kindergarten. Salvador is a free spirit. When something strikes his funny bone, he throws his head back and cackles like a second grade rumble stiltskin. There was one week when we were doing a multicultural project, so every grade set up the hallway to resemble a country, Egypt, Mexico, France. I asked my students to pretend we were on an airplane, going from country to country. And with that capacity for imagination and suspension of disbelief common to second graders, they did. So I asked all the kids to please buckle their seat belts, and they all buckled their imaginary seat belts. As we reached our cruising altitude, they peered out imaginary windows at the imaginary landscape below. I asked them to recline their seats, they reclined imaginary seats, sip their beverages, and they did. But for some reason, when I said, go ahead and open your peanuts, Salvador's hand shot up and com 
completely serious. He ran up to me and said, but Mr. Minkle, we don't have any peanuts. I said, Salvador, we don't have a plane either. This is just <laughs> pretending. <laughs> Vanessa keeps me on my toes. During the week of writer's workshop, we were talking about description in our mini lessons. And I was doing a one-on-one -on -one conference with another child and I asked Vanessa to please bring me a pencil. So I want to show you the pencil that Vanessa brought me that day. She said, hey, you just said, Vanessa, bring me a pencil. You didn't say a long pencil. You didn't say a good pencil. Mr. Minkle, you have to describe the pencil. <laughs> How do we honor the life within these children? What makes them on a planet of 6.7 billion human beings unique? I believe the answer lies in these two strands, high expectations, differentiated instruction. Teachers can differentiate in three ways, by academic readiness, by a child's learning style, and by student interest. In my class, we have five guided reading groups, with each child reading a book that's on their level, challenging, but not frustrating. I have a child named Eric who began the year reading at a level seven, as measured by the developmental reading assessment. He needed to be on an 18. By the end of the year, he had moved up to a 28, exactly where he needed to be, but I did it by giving him books at this level. To me, giving him those books was the equivalent of showing him a staircase that led up to a beautiful mountain, rather than standing up on that mountain and shouting down, hey Eric, you can do it, just jump. We can also differentiate by learning style. Many of my students are English learners, so when I teach them, I use English as a second language techniques. Bringing in objects to illustrate key vocabulary, acting out the story, doing motions, so you see 25 second graders all doing the motions, drizzle, drizzle, shovel, shovel, squish, Wish. The great thing about these techniques is that they often pull in students whose native language is English, but who happen to be visual, tactile, or kinesthetic learners. The third way we can differentiate is by student interest. In my class, we do writer's workshop, where kids decide each day what to write about. As a result, my students love writing, they've developed greater capacity for critical thinking, and I've learned a lot about them. Like the fact that Leanne knows a ton about guinea pigs and wants to be a veterinarian when she grows up. The fact that Tasha writes poetry in her home language of Marshallese that she shares with other students. High expectations and differentiated instruction are as relevant to developing skilled, creative teachers as they are to nurturing skilled and creative students. My heroes have always been those teachers who began teaching when I began, at about age 22, and are still teaching now they're in their 50s with the same passion, skill, and dedication to their craft. These teachers need differentiated professional development that acknowledges how different their needs are from those of a first-year teacher. All teachers need professional development that acknowledges that it's not just kids who can be tactile, kinesthetic, and visual learners, but many of us as adults are as well. I had the chance to talk to some middle school teachers in California, and they were engaged in the Japanese lesson study model, where teachers collaborate and craft and refine one lesson through peer observation and reflective dialogue. One of those teachers came up to me afterwards and said, you know, this is the most self-respect I've ever felt. And it's the most respect for my colleagues that I've ever felt. So we need to provide these kinds of choices for our teachers. At a policy level, No Child Left Behind set out an ambitious and necessary goal, closing the achievement gap by the year 2014. I believe the law will make greater strides toward achieving that goal if it can be crafted to reflect a simple truth. You cannot achieve high expectations without differentiation. I believe that we need to do what Arkansas, because of the leadership of Dr. Ken James, is going to be starting next year, which is piloting a growth model. One thing we can do with a growth model is stop only valuing how many students reach proficiency at a certain time, but how far individual students have come. If we do that, we do two things. First, we create an incentive for the best teachers to take on the lowest performing students because they have the most room for growth. We also create an incentive for the best principals to take on the lowest performing schools and the best superintendents to take on the lowest performing districts. The second thing we do is create an incentive for all kids to continue to get better. So a student like Fernando in my class who began the year as a non-reader, finished the year at a level 24, just shy of that benchmark for proficiency, will be celebrated as a success. A student like Griselda who came into my second grade class reading on a third grade level will be pushed to achieve her full potential. We have to do a better job at waiting high expectations to differentiated instruction. 
Because for all the negative talk about accountability in recent years, we are truly accountable to the children we teach. Teaching humbles you, and it's not just because there are times when you fall flat on your face. It's because the students we teach deal with such adversity, and they come through it with courage and with grace. Cesar won a running contest, won $10. I asked him what he was going to do with the money. And I thought he'd say, well, I'm saving up for a PlayStation 2 game, or maybe he'd buy some books. He said, I'm going to give it to my mom to help her buy some food for us. Cesar teaches me generosity. I teach many immigrants and children of immigrants. Marco arrived in Houston, Texas from Guatemala one day before our summer program for at-risk students began. I asked the seventh graders to write about their goals for the program, thinking they'd write about getting better at reading or math. He wrote, Yo quiero triunfar en este país. I want to triumph in this country. Marco taught me that for many immigrant families who come to the United States, success in a foreign language and a foreign culture is deeply connected to success in school. Saul is one of the most brilliant, articulate children I've ever met in my life, but he struggles harder to learn to read than I have ever struggled to learn anything. When Saul looks at a page, he doesn't see words. He sees loops and blotches and scribbles. Yet he comes into school every morning excited to learn, and he's never once taken out his frustration on me or on the other students. Saul teaches me determination. I was at a party a couple weeks ago for my friends whose twins were turning one year old, and I saw a baby at this party who was maybe three or four months old, wearing one of those silly bonnets, and I asked if I could hold her because she smiled at me and reached out. So I took her and her tiny hands curled on my sweater, she put her head on my shoulder, and she slept. The thing that amazed me is that I was a stranger, ten times her height, who might have dropped her or kidnapped her from her mom for all she knew. But she gave me that gift of trust. Our students still give us that gift. They trust us as adults to act in their best interest, no matter how many times we give them reason to doubt our wisdom or our leadership. We need to earn that trust. I want to leave you with a final story. I was teaching in New York City on September 11th. The rest of that year was hard on me and on the other kids. There was a little girl in my class named Heather who came up to me one day and said, You know, Mr. Winkle, I feel sad and scared all the time. Whenever I see a plane, I think it's going to crash down on my head. When I see people fighting in the subway station near my house, I feel sad. But you know what? I see angels everywhere I go, watching after me to make sure that I'll be okay. Our students have the capacity to see past the barriers in their lives. Poverty, violence, inequity, fear to their dreams. And they dream big. I believe that Daniela will become a master teacher. Griselda will become a doctor. Francisco will become a great artist. And Heather will overcome the fear of terrorism that afflicts this generation to find the good in our world. They are counting on us to help them develop the skills and the critical thinking that they so desperately need if they are to achieve everything they dream. I believe that by weighting these two ideas, high expectations and differentiated instruction, we can make the rose words ring true in the life of every child in every school. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now, put the foundations under them. Thank you all so much for the privilege of speaking.
respond and ask these questions and jump in and get excited. But I do want to say that if there are any of you who tend to be the quiet one in your group, who don't raise your hand because you're nervous, I would really encourage you to do it tonight. Speak the truth, even if your voice shakes. I'm nervous before every speech I give, but you have to do it because you have something important to say. It might seem like a small, ordinary thing to you, but it is significant. So I'd like to open it up now. Any questions or responses? I know you talked about standardization, um, but you've taught in both New York and California. There's got to be some regional differences as far as the way the education works. What did you notice particularly in your experience in both Oakland and in New York City? Mm -hmm. In both the settings, what I noticed is that it's not so much that America's schools are low performing. I think we get a really bad rap sometimes, and we need to realize that our schools are actually pretty good. The problem is the inequity that you can have schools next door to each other where one school has all the resources they need and another one is in serious poverty and crisis. Um, and I think that's really what we need to work on is the inequity more than anything else. Um, I do think a lot of the same issues tend to come up in all the different settings. And I also want to say that I feel more hopeful right now about the future of education in this state than I have ever felt at any point in my life. Um, I've had the opportunity to be part of some different roundtables on things like professional development or last weekend closing the achievement gap. And I can truly say, and I tend to be hard on administrators, but I think Dr. James is an incredible leader that he really understands children and acts in their best interest in every decision he makes. I think the same thing is true of his assistant, Janine Riggs, and really everyone else I've met who's shaping education in this state. I think there's amazing leadership right now and that we are on a really positive trajectory. I think that what happens now is people get frustrated because it is so slow. And it reminds me of the metaphor of walking through a fog where you don't even realize you're getting wet and suddenly you're drenched. I do think things are becoming really positive. Um, to respond just to another way to your question, um, I really noticed a difference in terms of just how diverse each community is. So when I was in Oakland, you know, what ESL meant was that you could have nine languages with 20 kids, which is one class that I worked in. Um, in the area of New York that I was in, you know, as I biked to work, I'd go through a neighborhood that was all Dominican, all Puerto Rican, all African American, and they were very segregated. In my school, even though it was ESL, it was all Spanish-speaking. Sometimes people use the terms diverse and students of color interchangeably, and it's not true. I, I taught in a very homogenous school, but it was all Puerto Rican and Dominican. Just out of curiosity, what is the, um, where is Harvey Jones in the, in terms of education and differentiated instruction, mm -hmm. what advice do you have to teachers who don't have a lot of options in differentiated instruction? Um, one thing is, I think I'm really lucky to be in a great district, not just in terms of resources, but in terms of leadership. Um, so, for example, in my class, we have a literacy coach and an ESL coach. They come in and every day we do guided reading. So we have five groups, but I'm only responsible for one group, and then each of those adults takes on another group. And they don't pull them out of the room and separate them. They take on a group. And we actually rotate, so at some point I have the kids with the lowest skills. And sometimes we end up kind of pushing those kids off on the specialists. I make sure that I have them as part of the rotation. In terms of advice, I would really say the important thing to me is to be able to show data and research to your principal. I think that principals really do listen to teachers more if you're able to say, you know, here's a study that shows that this will work. You know, or here's some data that shows, you know, I've been trying to guide it reading now for two months. This is how much my students' DRA scores have gone up. You know, and we tend to think of data in terms of these kind of big, standardized, multiple choice national tests, but data can also be at the local level, like this test the developmental reading assessment. You know, you can use a rubric to assess your students' writing and show how much they've grown. Um, at the same time, I've got to say, you know, I've worked with a lot of Teach for America teachers, like last weekend, and some of them are in positions where they have a very authoritarian principal who's not very flexible about those things. And all I can say with that is you really have to think about what's best for the kids, but you can't always just shut your door and do what's right for the kids, which sometimes we hold up as this noble thing. You know, you want to be influencing not just your own kids, but the kids in the rest of the grade, the kids in other classrooms, the kids in other schools in your district. And so those conversations have to happen. Um, and I just think in the most respectful but also firm way you can present it and say, this is what's good for kids. That's why I want to do this. Any other questions or responses? Hi, I just have a response. I'm from Kenya, and when you touched on, uh, when you asked us to pair share our greatest memory, I had a hard time. And the only time I could pick out was grade six and seven. 
uh, six to eight when I changed schools and went to a school that didn't believe in corporal punishment but respected the student and, and talking to the student rather than you know competing against teachers about who, which student, which class has the highest grades and if you did, were in a class that didn't have highest grades you were beaten. So when you said that how public, we as public, um, public servants can change policy when it was outlawed not to corporal punishment in my, in my country, now students are joined to school and I just wanted to share that. Thank you. And you know, I taught in West Africa for about four months, and one of the things I noticed is that kind of at an international level, sometimes we talk about what percentage of kids are in public school, but we don't talk about the quality of their education. Because you know, Senegal was very proud of the number of kids in school, but in that country, the educational system was very shaped by the French government, which did not have the best interest of the Senegalese at heart. And even when it became more Africanized in content, these structures remained like ranking children. So you knew you were number 117 out of 120. My host sister came home crying when she found that out. And it was because the system was designed to cull administrators for the French government. Um, so I really think we have to be reflective about the purposes of education. You know, there's always a societal purpose along with just shaping kids. I really admire your commitment to equity. Uh, something that I think we should all be concerned about. If you could just do one thing to make schools more equitable, what would it be? Raise teacher salaries for those lower income neighborhoods. Um, I think sometimes we tend to get really into competition in education. You know, I've been in meetings where our district says, oh, we need to compete with the next town over. You know, we do it at a state level. You know, Arkansas needs to beat these other states or raise our scores. Um, and I think competition is often based on this myth of scarcity, that we don't have enough resources for everyone. I think in a country with America's wealth and America's creativity, that's just not true. And I think that if you went into these lower income schools, and I had the absolute power, and I just offered, okay, you know, if you teach in these lower income schools, your salary will be $85,000 starting salary. We'd see a huge increase because the research that I've read shows that the biggest impact on the kids, especially lower income kids, is the quality of the teacher beyond anything else about resources, beyond home culture, or anything else. The problem is right now, you have to be almost a missionary in your zeal to go into these schools because you're going to be dealing with all kinds of issues you don't have to in other schools, getting paid less money. And then the worst part for those teachers is that you tend to have a very authoritarian administration because administrators don't want to be in those districts either. So we need to create some incentives for the best teachers and the best administrators to be going into those lower income areas. I think if we can do that, we'll see a huge change in equity. It's a great question. Yeah, I'd, ask you, I'd like to have you do another thin fair share right now. Um, there are two reasons for this. One is just that I really am curious about what you say. And the other is that I see education as being connected to so many other issues. So I'd like you to think about what do you see as the biggest issues facing American society today? And even if you're an international student, I think you really have a great perspective on this. You often are more aware of what's going on in America than some of us are because you see it from the outside as well. So what do you see as the biggest issues facing American society today? Think about that. <laughs> and please share with your partner your thoughts.
Uh, both of us are, I'm a retired teacher and I've been substituting. So we've both have been talking that today's quality really depends so much on parents and parenting uh, children. And we both think that, you know, so many parents just don't care, they don't come, they don't do anything with the children. And today we had a free day at the library and it was wonderful to see whole families there, fathers and mothers. And the father, one thing, there was a whole family of uncles, a couple of uncles, young uncles, teenagers, and grandpa, grandma, daddy, and a mother, and some smaller kids. And he was saying, now, are we all hungry? We're going to go eat. And it was so good, but they had a whole lot of fathers with the children. And in so many of the schools, you do not see the children with the father. I had just a uh, troubled class Hit the carton through fifth grade in one room, where the fifth graders have been retained. And it's the kids, I call them the forgotten kids because they're the kids that can't fit in any classroom. And the principal I had called me and said, We needed somebody in the school because they only got somebody full time. Well, I about got killed, but <laughs> I mean, these kids are. But that's exactly what we need as parents. situation which we have just recently divided into boys and girls middle school in Jacksonville and I was wondering how much of this you see around the country and whether or not you think it works and then to highlight on this topic since I am at an all boys school it comes to light that truly the parent that is the most powerful is the father in the family and when the father is missing it's quite tragic to those kids and I see that more and more being at an all boys school but I was wondering, what is your take on the separate gender schools? And do you think it will work, or do you see it other places, or just what is your concept? Um, I definitely see some positives. I hate second grade, so I don't deal with hormones, which I know is a big reason sometimes. Um, and I, I did have a group in New York where my after-school program, I structured so the girls were together one day and boys were together. And it was just kind of nice for them to be with kids of their own gender. And we, the very first thing we did one of those Venn diagrams about how are boys different from girls. It was amazing how different what the two groups said. And we talked about, well, are these stereotypes, you know, really true all the time? Or are they true some of the time? And almost all of them, they realized, well, they're only true sometimes. You know, I know exceptions to this. I think the thing that's hard when you have gender-separated classrooms is that it's hard for you to model respectful interaction between men and women, um, you know, because they're not around other kids. Um, of the other gender to really talk about that or focus on that. But I do think it has some possibilities. And anyone else on the big issues that you see facing American society? It's okay if these are totally unrelated to education. Care to touch on social security reform? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to start right now because that's not my area, but I do want to hear some other ideas and then I'm thinking about how these connect to education. I see all these issues as impacting our work as teachers, but I'll think about it. Any other issues? Uh, yeah, I think um, maybe one of the just sort of a key issue in everything is sort of a, a need for a real direction and a real um, understanding of priorities in this country and uh, a need to know whether are we going to expend all our resources on foreign policy, on, are we going to expend our resources on domestic policy, uh, spend our resources developing the economy or uh, watching out for the environment. It's just there seems to be so much of a lack of um, agreement on what our priorities are. And I think that's really uh, important. Something that's happening now in society that's reflected in schools it, uh, the, edu the achievement gap in schools is just the huge gap between the rich and the poor. And it's not just about money, it's about political access, political power, it's about quality of life, health care, um, job security, and things of that nature. That divide, I see, is also reflected in what you experience every day in the classroom. So I think both of those are parallel. Um, problems. So one or two more if anybody else has thoughts. 
equitable health care. I teach at a school that's on Unified School Improvement, and I see it every day. These children have a flu, mom can't stay at home, they don't have money to, to go to the doctor, these kids are falling asleep, they have a fever, I send them to the nurse, mom can't come get them. And I'm like, how am I supposed to teach this classroom full of children with the flu, with the strep? I'm spraying Lysol all day, and these kids are miserable. And it's because they don't have adequate health care, and mom can't get out and work. Um, we had spoken about globalization, and in a world where there's increased technology and increased contact among cultures and cross-culturally, it's really important to have children and youth learn about different cultures, um, different religions, different countries, so that there's a better understanding, and that can hopefully help um, a lot of the issues that we have internationally. That's a great point. I want to respond to what a few different people have said kind of backwards. So beginning with that one, when I was in England, um, I worked in something called development education. It doesn't really exist in America. It's sort of like Peace Corps for elementary school kids. And in America, we tend to focus only on cultural differences, and we really focus on cultural similarity because we don't want to get into anything too touchy. Development education focused on the political connections, the economic connections, and the conflicts between different cultures because they knew that England had a huge impact on so many different countries in terms of colonization. And I do think that's a great point, especially right now with the Middle East. You know, the original if anyone talked about that as a big issue, wars or the instability in the Middle East. Just one my way, okay. <laughs> and and to me, I mean that's a huge thing. Like when my wife and I were actually teaching in New York City, you know, during September 11th, and we had students do something called a, a KWL. What do you know? What do you want to know? What did you learn about Muslim and Arab people? It was unbelievable the way that they had sucked in all these negative media images. So what they knew about Muslims and Arabs is that they were dirty, they lived in caves, they hated us, they wanted to kill us. And then over the next few weeks, we started reading a bunch of books about kids in Egypt, you know, kids in Iraq, kids in Iran. And they realized, you know, all these things that they were saying were not true. It's kind of like the boy-girl Venn diagram. And I think you're exactly right. And I think especially because America is so powerful right now in terms of military, economic, political might, that's incredibly important. Um, kind of to go back to what a couple of other people said, you know, first of all, in terms of talking about social security, I think about that in terms of just an aging population. Um, we're going to have so many old people, and it's for a good reason, it's because medical care is better. I think schools are one of the only communities left outside, you know, churches, temples, or mosques that are intergenerational, but I think we could really do a better job of pulling in the elderly. Um, it's unbelievable to see what an impact the elderly can have on especially troubled kids and just that relationship developing. A lot of times, older people are lonely, and kids want attention. I mean, one adult cannot do it for 25 kids. They want to tell me everything. And so I think that's, it doesn't exactly respond to your question, but I think we really need to do a better job of utilizing the elderly and really pulling them into our communities, especially in schools. Um, someone talked earlier about, you know, inequity in terms of poverty. And one thing, I don't know if anyone said, you raise your hand if you talked about racial segregation as one of the biggest problems in American society. One, two, three. That, to me, is such a huge thing. I think sometimes we're not aware of it because it's just the air we breathe. We're so used to how segregated neighborhoods have become. A lot of people talk tonight about equity. When people talk about equity, what they often mean are equal resources for you know, kids in this poor school and kids in this rich school. You know, I would add this book to your book list that I saw out there. It's called The Shame of the Nation by Jonathan Kozel, The Restoration of Apartheid Schooling in America. He makes this great point that, you know, the civil rights leaders in the 1950s and 1960s were not pushing for separate but equal, which is kind of where we are right now. We're talking about, well, we need to provide equal resources to these segregated schools. Those civil rights leaders were pushing for integrated schools. You know, every time I come to Little Rock, I think about the Little Rock Nine. You know, I think about Melba Patillo, who had acid sprayed in her eyes because the sight of this young African-American woman carrying herself with dignity inspired rage in a lot of white adults in the community. In many schools in the Delta right now, like in Chicago, like in LA, like in New York, you have 500 students in a school and one white student. That's not what the Little Rock Nine were fighting for. That's not integration. You know, and in 1957, you know, this ruling said that even if these schools have equal resources, it's harming them to be separated from one another. And so I always think, you know, about Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech about how right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will join hands with little white boys and little white girls as brothers and sisters. I still think that's a really important goal. Um, and I do feel hopeful. You know, in my class this year, the two best friends were a girl named Sydney, who's Caucasian, and a boy named Geraldo, who's Mexican-American. And 
in this community where I come from, Springdale, these kids are growing up as best friends now because we've had such a huge influx of Hispanic immigrants. And that's really changing things. Um, but I think we need to ask ourselves, you know, two questions. First, what are we going to do about these third world conditions in many of America's rural and urban centers that tend to be definitely lower income but also predominantly African American and Hispanic communities? But also the harder question, you know, what are we going to do to really bring about integration? I think right now people are reluctant to talk about that sometimes, um, and we've kind of pushed it under the rug. But I think it's incredibly important, I think it's central to everything we do. Jonathan Kozel has been making these arguments for a long time now, nothing's changed. I think one way that we could make his argument more effective is to do what a guy named William Schultz did, who's the head of Amnesty International. He said, you know, Americans are not going to care about other countries because of the moral argument. It's not going to work. We see that right now in the Darfur region of Sudan. You know, we know a genocide's going on there, and not much has happened. So what we need to do is point out that it's in our own best interest to act because we are connected to all these other countries. And it gives the example of in Russia, someone got tuberculosis, you know, because the Russian prisons were overcrowded. Well, New York broke out with a tuberculosis epidemic a little later. I think we need to try to make that argument in terms of segregated schools. It doesn't just hurt lower income African American kids, it hurts white kids too, because they're not having the chance to learn about a culture that's different from theirs, that has a lot of value. You know, and beyond that, if it is hurting these kids to be in segregated schools, it's a lot more expensive to put someone in prison than it is to make sure that they get an education and close the achievement gap. California bases their projected prison cells on fourth grade reading scores because it's such a powerful predictor. So I do think that's a huge issue. Now I'd like to ask you another thing here, share, which is to really zero in now, beyond just society, what do you see as the biggest issues in education? And again, I'm asking for two reasons. One is because I'm just interested in the brilliance of this group, what you see. The other reason is that I'm really going to have the opportunity, whether as state or national teacher, to have a lot of conversations with policymakers, with lawmakers, and I'd like to know what you see as the big issues in education. So think about that. And please tell your partner. Go. <laughs> John? Teachers are talking to each other every day about best practices. 
to differentiate well, you have to know what to do if you teach second grade and you get a kid who's on a fifth grade level. So you have to go talk to those fifth grade teachers. I have two kids right now who are really came in on a kindergarten level. And I had a mental block about going down. You know, I, I was willing to go to first grade, but for some reason not kindergarten. Well, once I finally started doing what I'd learned in kindergarten classes, those two kids took off because that's what they needed. And it happened at a much accelerated rate because cognitively they were at a much higher level than a kindergarten level. Hey Justin, um, what I think is wrong with education, with the of higher education for a moment, is that the compartmentalization of into majors and to, to try to dictate, you know, what you go into with your science, your political science. I mean, looking further at this globalized community, the world's flat air, it seems like all the innovation is coming from the synthesis of ideas. You know, in London, they're doing translational research to applying science to political science. In Denmark, they're using metaphor from, from, um, from theoretical uh, notions of chemistry into ideas of the economy. Um, you know, I went through college, you know, four majors, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And basically, I didn't learn anything until I got out of college. And when I went into the real world, we were thinking about idea-based learning. You know, this, this compartmentalization of political science thinking one certain way. I think I just find it really constricting. And I really, like you talked earlier about how you shaped your curriculum at Brown University. Um, you know, is that type of model replicable to other universities where you focus on the issue that you're passionate about and you design your own curriculum and give the students enough autonomy to make their own decisions? And it, lastly, it seems to me that a lot of higher education is based upon, you know, geared towards the professors. That their research, Keith and I were just talking about this, that, <laughs> no offense to you, that it, the curriculum is designed, you know, it's, it's not towards the students, it's not helping out the students, it's that it maintains the, the research and it, it maintains this focus on, on one field, you're not allowed to kind of, you know, diversify yourselves to that from one field to the next. And I just find, I just feel really disappointed thinking back and learn more from two years after college than the four years of college. And Patrick said earlier, you know, when I was talking to him, it's unbelievable how different these students are in this program and what they're interested in their past experiences, the countries they come from. Differentiation isn't just for elementary school. It applies to middle, it applies to high, it applies to the university level. And we tend not to focus enough on just teaching practice in higher education. Research is important, but so is just the quality of the teaching going on at the university level. A lot of the things that we learn as elementary school teachers, like about higher order thinking questions. What level of questions are you asking? Are you just asking questions you already know the answer to? That's relevant to professors teaching practice too. I and mean, I had a professor, at Cornell, who said that he thought every professor should be required or at least encouraged to take a class as a student once a year. He said it would do two things. It would make them more reflective about their teaching practice, because they'd have to sit there as a student for a year, but it would also get them out of that box you're talking about. And it would make them kind of think, okay, how does my discipline connect to these other disciplines? Because you tend to see everything through your own lens. We're coming up on the end of our time, and I'm, I just want to say, first of all, the main thing I would encourage everyone to do is what I've learned is try not to separate yourself from society so as we talk about these critiques. We're part of society, you know, and teachers are sometimes bad about this. You know, it's easy for us to criticize education as if we're not part of it. It reminds me of the metaphor of someone standing on a ship and saying, well, those holes look kind of rotten there, and the sails are ragged. You know, look at all these barnacles while the ship is sinking, and we need to do something about that. Um, and I know these are the kinds of people that do that, so it's kind of preaching to the choir. But I found, you know, you can contact legislators, especially at the state level. You know, we have some wonderful people like Representative Rangi, who's a career teacher, an African-American guy who's in the house right now. And he's come to everything I've been at in terms of these roundtables on education. You can contact these people. You know, with No Child Left Behind's reauthorization coming up, I've been calling a lot of senators. I don't ask, can I please speak with Senator Obama, but I say, you know, could I please speak with the legislative assistant that's in charge of education? And then they do call you back. You know, we have the chance to have a conversation. Um, so I really focus on that. I also just want to say thank you all so much. Um, it's amazing to have this kind of a group together, and everyone could be at home right now watching TV. You know, you came out because you care about education. The best thing about being named to these honors is realizing how many people outside education care about kids, care about our work as teachers, and have a voice that can really contribute to our own understanding. So I am going to stick around for a little while. I'd love to talk to people more, but I want to be respectful of your time. And just thank you all so much for coming tonight.
Dr. James, you made a y'all made a terrific choice from Arkansas, and I mean, what a what a spectacular performance. Uh, we are you are invited. We have a reception afterwards, so please stay and, and, and visit. I do want to point out one thing, though, in the variance to Ken James and in honor of Ellen Nichols doing Ken Nelson when I'm getting ready to tell, is that you know when you asked what was your greatest elementary school, I was in the third grade at Eastside Elementary School in Batesville, Arkansas with Dr. Ken James, who were third grade classmates. You all have a great evening. <laughs>